Hello once again and thank you for joining me on the Waters and Stanton video channel. Magnetic attraction, well I suppose that's got several interpretations but in home radio terms it conjures up the idea of operating mobile either on the HF bands or the VHF bands. Now operating mobile on the VHF bands is relatively easy because you can put a small magnetic mount on the car, you can use a hatchback or a boot mount, they all seem to work pretty well. When it comes to the HF bands, things are a little bit more, not tricky, but a little bit more critical. You need to go through the right procedure, you need to have the right magnetic mounts and so forth to get um, good results. But the good attraction of a magnetic mount is that it doesn't alter the car at all. There's no uh, holes to drill and hopefully there's no marks left on the car. Now a little bit of history about my own personal HF mobile operation. I was given a book back in 1959 before I was licensed and it was all about ham radio mobile operation published by the AWRL. And I found it a fascinating book. If you read it now, it's quite alarming because all the mobile equipment in a vehicle in those days was valve, valve operated. It mean, meant to say you had to have an HT line. You had to have a voltage for the heaters of the valves. And my first um, mobile installation was a command transmitter, which I'll just show you on the screen now. Command transmitter and a command receiver. <laughs> and they needed HT voltages, and the voltages were obtained by something called a dynamotor. That dynamotor was operated by 12 or 24 volts. Um, I can't really remember exactly how I installed it all, but I didn't have a driving license then, so it was the kindness of my father that allowed me to put all this gear <laughs> into the car. And the antenna was a centre-loaded whip. And I do recall this, it was a, the, the actual coil was uh, wound on a bit of wood, which is about three inches diameter, and I think it was an old flagpole that my grandfather had discarded. And I sawed off a section of this uh, flagpole, about, I don't know, about nine inches long, I suppose, and I wound a coil around it, which was the centre loading coil for my mobile antenna. And the top and bottom of this antenna was some copper antenna uh, whip material, military uh, whip material. It's quite stiff, but it's only about, I don't know, uh, half inch diameter, something like that, but it was it was adequate. And I think I must have drilled a hole in the top and the bottom of this bit of wood and stuck the rod in there so that one top one bit was the top part of the whip and the other was the bottom part of the whip. And the way I adjusted it to resonance was simply to wind some coil, uh, some wire onto the coil and use hand capacity. And as I got nearer and nearer the optimum frequency for 160 meters, which is the band I operated on then, I found the hand capacity started about five or six inches away from the coil. And the more sensitive that coil was to hand capacity, the closer I knew I was to the resonant frequency. I didn't have a VSW meter. <laughs> it, was, it was really cut and dry. I had no idea how much power was coming out of the transmitter. I had no idea how close I was to resonance, but it did work. It was my first mobile uh, operating system in a car covering 160 meters before I had a driving license. I dread to think what mess it was. <laughs> I'm, I'm so glad that my father allowed me to put it into the car and I don't recall actually causing any damage. I can't for the life of me remember how I earthed the system. I, had, I must have fed it with Kyx cable. But of course in those days cars were really chunky. I mean the bodywork of a car was really chunky. Whether I drilled a hole in the car and not told my father I don't know but there we are. My first mobile system. Anyway, enough of that. Let's take a look 
at the magnetic mount and how it works. Back in the days before we had magnetic mounts, keen ham radio mobile operators, knowing that the best place for an antenna was in the centre of the roof of the car, would drill a hole in the car in order to mount the antenna. Well, from a ham radio point of view, it may have been a good idea. As regards the resale value of the vehicle, well, perhaps not such a good idea. How does a magnetic mount work? Well, I think we all understand that in order for a vertical mobile antenna to work properly, it does need to have an earth or a ground plane beneath it. That, after all, is the other and important part of the antenna. We could use hatch mounts or boot mounts, but that is not always possible, particularly on the modern car where there's a lot of plastic around and it doesn't get the antenna right in the centre of the roof. We know that RF energy will travel through a capacitor whilst a DC voltage uh, and current will not. And that's how a magnetic mount works. If you look at the picture of the vehicle there and you imagine that the magnetic mount is one side of a capacitor and the metal roof of the vehicle is the other side of the capacitor, if we bring them close enough then RF energy will flow through. And this in effect means that the outer sheathing of the coax is now coupled to the car roof. The larger the magnetic mount and the closer it becomes to the roof, the larger the capacitor. And large capacity is important for LF energy to travel through, whilst higher and higher frequency energy, such as um, 20 meters, 15 meters, and the VHF bands, requires less capacity. And that's why a larger magnetic mount is needed for the lower frequencies, whilst for the higher frequencies, a much smaller magnetic mount will work. And on the right side of this picture, you'll see a capacitor. And that really is what we're looking at. A magnetic mount and the car form a capacitor. A magnetic mount with a diameter of about 6 or 8 inches is fine for 20 metres and frequencies above. But when we start to go lower, we need more capacity. And the popular way of achieving that is with a three-way magnetic mount. Provided the magnetic mount is large enough for the frequency in use, it forms a very effective mount for a vertical antenna and an excellent earth return. But there is one more very important item that is often missed out, and if it is missed out, can cause all sorts of problems. Common mode currents find it extremely easy to travel down the outer of the coax cable with such installations, and that really can be a headache. It manifests itself in the inability to get a decent VSWR, or you may find that the VSWR seems to change from hour to hour, day to day, or as you move things around in the vehicle. Fortunately, there's a very simple solution. Enter the famous ferrite core. I find for 20 meters about five turns is adequate. Uh, so it's one, two. Three, four, five. A little bit of a, a bit over. You can go closer if you want to, but uh, that's probably okay. And then all I normally do is I normally fasten that with um, a couple of tie wraps. So there's your common mode choke made in a few uh, seconds, and that will solve a lot of your VSWR problems and uh, problems in trying to uh, get the an antenna to tune properly and to be stable. And that by the way will cover 20 through to 10 meters. Uh, if you want something for 40 meters and 80 meters you need about 8 or 9 turns. 
one of the most important things for a mag mount when you're putting it on the vehicle is to make sure that it's got protection there. That is a very thin plastic membrane which stops it from scratching the car. And you want to make sure that's cleaned regularly. So every so often I would take that off the car, just make sure that the car roof is clean and just clean that. If you leave that on for a long time, you'll start to get sort of a, possibly a mark on the roof of the car. So take it off every I don't know, three or four weeks, just make sure there's no marks on the roof of the car and just give that a good clean with a damp cloth, let it dry, and then put it straight back on the roof of the car. Mag mounts come in all shapes and sizes. This one is roughly six inches diameter, and as you can see, it's got an SO239 socket on, which matches a lot of uh, popular antennas, particularly VHF antennas. Diamond manufacture an excellent range of high quality mag mounts. This one is ideal for HF operation. Also worth checking out the Watson brand, which are budget price magnetic mounts, and they're all on our website, so uh, take a look. The modern mag mount is pretty strong, and it will certainly stick to a car roof pretty well. One of the popular designs is the triple mag mount, which is particularly good for the lower HF bands. The problem is that once it's on the car, you can't get it off that easily. What you mustn't do is to stick a screwdriver underneath and try and lever it because you'll seriously damage the car roof and you may still not get the mag mount off, particularly if it's a triple mag mount. There's a much easier way of doing it. What you do is you simply put your aerial onto the mag mount, screw it on firmly like that, and then use it as a lever and you'll find that it comes off the roof so much easier. Now, if you're only interested in VHF and UHF, you can get away with a smaller mag mount, provided the antenna is not too large. Now, you remember the little plastic cover that came with your mag mount originally? Keep that, because if you remove the antenna from your car, you can pop that on there, and it weatherproofs the socket on the mag mount. A lot of the HF antennas require a 3/8 inch thread, and Serio do a nice little mag mount you can see here, which is on our website. It's got a 3/8 inch socket, and you can put your HF antenna straight into it. Now, if you have two antennas on your car, two mag mounts on your car, here's an idea. If you could find a way of connecting the earth side of those two magnetic mounts together, you increase the capacity and probably you'll have quite good operation on all bands from 40 metres through to 10 metres. So that's really the basics of installing and using a magnetic mount. It makes a very tidy installation. And I know a lot of people are going mobile now because, well, it's a... It's another sort of form of activity, but it does get you away from the noise. I mean, so many hams now are plagued by noise at home, and it does enable you to go out and get away from the noise and also find a decent location. Because do remember that if, for example, you operate near the coasts, you can park up near, near the uh, uh, coast, then you get a distinct advantage. You get a signal gain. Uh, which is worthwhile ha having and very noticeable. And as I say, it's nice to get, a get away uh, from, from the noise. I personally don't any longer operate mobile in as much as on the move. Um, I think that probably, particularly for HF, it can be quite dangerous because on HF, you're tending to tune around hunting for signals, and if you take your eyes off the road, even for a second or so, it can be disastrous. So, although I talk about mobile operation, uh, I only operate mobile when I can park up somewhere and find a, uh, a nice location with some low noise. The only problem with low noise, interesting fact, low noise is great. We all yearn for low noise, but the problem is not everybody's got low noise. And if, you're, if you operate in a low noise location, what actually happens is you, you call stations that you can hear, but they don't come back to you because they've got a higher noise level. I think I mentioned before when I was up in the Shetlands, 
beautiful up there, I mean, apart from the countryside and so forth, um, really low noise. But the disadvantage up there is you can hear stations at five and six, five and seven, and you call them, but they don't come back to you. And the reason they don't come back to you is because they can't hear you. The reason they can't hear you is because they've got a much higher noise level than you have. So operating in a low noise environment is, is, is great, but it does have a few little problems that you don't, you don't realise until you've been operating for a little while. You think, why aren't these stations coming back to me? You think, wait a minute, they probably can't hear me. OK, well, thanks for watching this video. I hope it's been useful. Um, I'm going to come back to mobile antennas because there's a lot more to say about mobile antennas, different types of mobile antennas, how you should fit them and whether one is better than the other, etc, etc. So I will come back to that uh, in a future video. In the meantime, thank you so much for your support on this channel. It's very much appreciated. And don't forget that um, apart from this video channel, we, we run a very busy ham radio business from a Portsmouth uh, warehouse location. You can go to our website and see all the products that uh, we've got there. And if you've got any questions, you can always pick up the phone and speak to one of the sales guys. In the meantime, enjoy your ham radio. You take care and as usual, I'll see you in the next video. Bye for now.